Good evening. I am so excited for this to be the first event, as Yorg said, in a series of events that are going to be happening over the next several months at the Goethe Institutes in North America, Canada, and Mexico under the heading, Thinking is Dangerous. And when we were thinking about an in-person event in this precarious period, uh, we wanted to do something a little bit lighthearted uh, to, mark, to mark the holiday. Uh, love is very much central to Hannah Arendt's life and work. And I'm not going to talk too much about that, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about her magnificent love affair with her second husband, Heinrich Blücher. Hannah Arendt met Heinrich Friedrich Ernst Blücher in the early spring of 1936 at a public lecture in Paris. He was a former communist militant who had fought on the streets of Berlin with the Spartacus League. He fled to Paris by way of Prague in 1934 and became friends with Bertolt Brecht and Walter Benjamin. He was a fantastic talker. The poet Hermann Brock described his speaking style as unstoppable flow of oratory brilliance. That's what we're going to expect from our actors in a minute. <laughs> Dwight MacDonald said he was a true hopeless anarchist, both in mind and thought. Blücher was very much a Socratic spirit. He never published, unlike Hannah Arendt. His great work was teaching and conversation. And he told his wife that at birth he had been blessed and cursed by a good fairy who had given him a good brain and a bad fairy who had given him writer's block. Thankfully, this curse did not prevent him from writing long love letters to Hannah Arendt. A few weeks after their initial meeting in Paris, which had been organized by their friend Shannon Kleinbert at a dinner at Arendt's apartment so that they could get to know one another, Blücher knew they were going to get married. He arrived in a suit, wearing a hat and carrying a walking stick, and Arendt playfully took to calling him Monsieur. He had no papers, which meant he couldn't get a job. And like many emigres, he was forced to move from hotel to hotel so he spent his days pretending to be a tourist. Their relationship was the kind of love affair that you should make a film about. It unfolded under the conditions of exile in Paris in the 30s, sitting in cafes in the Latin Quarter, talking with Jean-Paul Sartre and Albert Camus, attending seminars on Jewish mysticism with Gershom Scholem and Walter Benjamin, and Kozhev's lectures on Hegel's phenomenology. The erotic attraction between them was nourished by their intellectual connection. And when asked how they met, Arendt liked to say that it had been but one evening's courtship. Their dinner that night lasted into the early hours of the morning until Arendt kicked him out. A couple weeks later, Blucher told her that she was in love with him and that they were going to be married. She just didn't know it yet. Now, I am going to add that Arendt didn't know Blucher was married when he said that to her, although he was aware that she was, and in the process of getting a divorce. What you're going to hear the night is a gorgeous selection of their most intimate love letters, which have been out of print, unfortunately, for some time. These are the love letters from the early days of their relationship that blossomed into one of the great love affairs of the 20th century. So please join me in welcoming our actors this evening from the Lee Strasberg Institute, Megan Sizzler and Ricard Clausen. A harsh blow has landed on Berlin. Comrades whose faces are engraved in my memory with their ever-changing expressions have been locked up in the cellars of the Gestapo. This blow has ripped a black hole in the day, and the force of the explosion hurls me into the darkest corner. There I huddle with bruised bones, the hours dull and full of a of questions that slump around me, refusing to move on. 
when I finally turn on the light, Marx's words about the victims of the Paris Commune come to mind. They are enshrined in the heroic heart of the working class. So it is, and so be it. But as I am not alone today, and today I don't want to be alone, and since I do want to talk to you now that you're here, then I would, among the three of us, like to have a discuss discussion, because I've got something to add. Therefore, there are three chairs in the room. If you would like to take the same one you had last time, and then Robert can have the third one. But first I want to get an old dream off my chest. I had a dream when X was executed. X had a wooden leg, and his closest comrades forced a party to buy him a particularly good one. Because he himself was a man chiseled of the finest wood, the kind you cannot buy. Years ago, he had sacrificed his leg for our cause, and now his head. A large scaffold was erected that reached to the sky, but without touching it. And ascending to the scaffold was a long flight of stairs in countless small steps and landings in a few large bounds. At the top, the executioner was reaching for his knife. X had been bound and thrown down before him on the floor of the scaffold. And then suddenly marching all the way up the stairs, one man after the other, a long procession of comrades came to the rescue. I saw I knew that they would be too late, for all of them, down to the last man, also had wooden legs. So they thundered up the stairs, to the mighty rhythm shook the earth, but without waking it. But because of the infirmity, the hell brought by these descending comrades had to come too late. So I ran, and I shouted, let me pass, let me pass. It was as if an order, right, march, had been shouted to an infantry column so that the artillery could get past them to the front. Everyone stepped to the right, and to the beat of the wooden legs shouted out in unison, let by old Hein, his legs are fine. And I ran. I ran past them up the stairs. I ran as I once had run as a boy when I won the prize in the relay race, ran with all my might because I was running body and soul. I got there and threw myself over X, just as the executioner was about to bring down his long knife. The blow struck me in the leg. I lost consciousness, and then I woke up with the words, now it's up to all the others. X is dead. Neither I nor anybody else could save him. But I feel that we have constantly to stay in shape so that we can run with all our might to the aid of someone else they have caught or will catch. Like when Hans Westermann was killed in prison in Hamburg, he was the best man in Hamburg, next to Andre. Westermann had joined us ready for action when he was still a sailor, and he was always in the thick of every battle. They bashed his thick skull in because he held a good brain that always looked out for our interest. They crushed his thick spine because it was capable of carrying the heaviest responsibilities for us. When I found out that Carl lay in the oil bath because there wasn't a sound spot left on his whole body. Or when the boy from Charlottenburg was literally kicked to death by ten thugs when the ribs from the boy from Moabit was shattered with iron bars because that heart, which was beating entirely for us, had to be destroyed. Or when the fellow prisoner got a message to me that Paul J. had cried out all night in pain. He was full of silence, strength. And all I can say is that if he cried out, I have no idea how we could possibly stand up to them. When, when I sat with comrades and we talked about these men and later, time and again, 
we asked ourselves, did so-and-so maybe break down after all? Each time, I forced myself to swallow a motto that I now wish to repeat now that we three friends are sitting together because I promised I would tell you everything. When we wanted to drink, a, drink down a solemn glass in toast to them and say, Comrades, let's drink to the man who is being tortured right now to divulge our names and who will not name them. May his cigarette not run out. May his delirium be filled with the beloved face of his wife. And may his poor old mother's heart not break. And we, we won't forget. I am worried, still without word from you, or better, because I have no confirmation of my letters to you and do not know if they have ended up in your hands. Please don't see this in any way as an obligation to write to me, just send me a confirmation. In haste, anxiety, and under a cloud. H. Dearest, how foolish of me not to confirm your letters. I have them all. And I confirm them with my heart. You see, I had my daily chores, and for a whole day could not bring myself to mail my last black letter to you, but finally I had to. So, to your scrawl, I have already got the hang of it, so whatever you do, don't take your hand away from me. I am happy that you're so happy with your room, the mountains, wine, but what really warms my heart is that you're singing, that you're happy about my letters, that you express a liking for me, and even profess a predilection towards me, especially if in this case this predilection were to be interpreted differently, let us say, as a prelude to love. And yes, of course, you must impose on me as completely as you would impose on yourself and treat me as you would treat yourself, but treat yourself a little better. But that is something I want to do, to treat you somewhat better than you treat yourself. And do not feel sorry for me because of the 10 years. I am fully aware of what I have and of who you are as a woman and what you will be and will yet be. Let me be the judge for what can you know about these things. Liebste, ich liebe dich. With which you could perhaps rhyme. Heinrich. My dear friend, that indeed is the question. Can I take a seat in that third chair that you have so generously offered me? Nothing and no one can justify my right to do so. And if my very closest woman friend, unfortunately dead a hundred years now, once said, the reason it is so terrible to be a Jewess is because one must constantly legitimize oneself, then I am of the opinion that one can never and must never legitimize oneself. It is always others who do the legitimizing. And these others have not wanted to. And in my case, they have even gone to the trouble of making it very clear to me in person. And though you have forced me so very wonderfully, so very uncomfortably to show trust, I show it only to you, only privately. A third party to me that is already alien territory, and I do not fit into a tradition or context in which a simple stroke of the pen can cross me out. Look, you yourself said everything speaks against it. What is this everything? apart from prejudices and the difficulties and the petty fear, except that we might not have a world in common, that I simply won't be able to go south with you, and so on and so forth. Uh, this was supposed to be a real letter, but I was interrupted. Today your letter, and now I've had enough. At least I know now that you've received them all. Today I have to throw together an article in a hurry, but I can't get your three-chair letter out of my head. There are also some down-to-earth matters I want to ask your advice about. Feels quite strange, really. I've never asked anybody for advice. Great that you can read my scrawl. No one else can, except for my mother. I am writing at the Congress. I'm out of paper, and so I'm signing off. 
H. My dear, you have not received the letter yet that I sent you on Friday, which answered both of your letters. In addition, I had included a letter to me from a French friend, information about a position, so it was quite thick. I can't repeat what I wrote right now because the mailbox will be emptied in a few minutes and I don't want to have you wait any longer. What rubbish. I thought you didn't like my letter and that was why you weren't writing. It was one half miffed and three quarters despairing. And now laugh, darling, <laughs> as I am laughing. I'm churning out one article after another. You won't like them, but I'll send them all to you. I'm a little bewildered and crazed that all my stupid ideas weren't true and that you are still with me. My dearest, I think I love you. I mean it. <laughs> and slowly, very slowly, I am beginning to see that no reasons should stand in the way of love. If only I didn't have such damn good reasons. This letter is only a tiny bit longer than three lines. As a compensation, I kiss your mouth and nose. H. Dearest, <laughs> your letter came yesterday. I can breathe again, and now I breathe. Oh, deeply filling myself with your love. It warms me. And now the schnapps is no longer lying on eyes in Geneva, but flowing through my blood. The thick letter that I believe long lost finally dropped belatedly through the slot in the door today. And how could this letter weigh down with doubts and caught up in the jumble of three French holidays have reached me on time? I'm glad it took its time. This way the melody of my dearest I think I love you had a chance to overtake it. You think you do? Seriously, I believe you, <laughs> and I've never believed another woman before. Many have told me that they love me, but I never believed a single one of them. You, I believe, if you would only tell me. When your second letter overtook the first, it was the second time that your actions anticipated your brooding words. For I've always thought of your day because it was the best day of my life. And when your letters filled with doubts came, I said to myself, why keep dissecting her tormented words? You for whom the seal of all her actions forever burns on your lips. One thing I know for certain, with you there can be no lasting contradiction between word and deed. You're a cast of one mold. But as it is a living mold, life can pull apart your elements to extreme tension then they fly back together all the harder. Well, as you are now my woman, can I be so soft and say that I long for you? With your kisses, you have laid into the mouth of a golem, a note, on which is written, my darling, I love you. And now he's singing and jumping all over the place, even if with a heavy tongue and bumbling feet. But then he found a very disturbing note between his teeth, which seemed particularly urgent, which particularly concerned him, because he owes his own existence to a Jewish legend. Written on the note is, think of the Jews, you rascal. You've snatched away their best woman without thinking of them. It's typical of your stony disposition. What does a good golem do? He thinks on as far as his thanks and his thoughts permit him. Egoistic as he is, he combines the comfortable with the useful and writes an epistle to the Jews for his Jewish wife. The letter on the Jewish war. A careful analysis of the declarations of Marx and his friend Engels when the Jewish question occasionally resurfaces is one of the most urgent tasks of the Workers' Party.
the new situation, dying nationalism, with the help of an injection of racial hatred, turns itself into murderous euphoria. The spiritual ferment for this poison brew is anti-Semitism. The concrete outcome is that the Jews of the capitalist world will be butchered because they are Jews. This could turn them into a real nation out of the necessity to fend off the most bitter anguish of body and soul. If anti-Semitism is the ferment of racial hatred, then this concrete question will be able to turn itself dialectically into one of the ferments of the world revolution. What marvelous, rebellious dynamite is piled up here? Why do the Jews refuse to go to Spain? For that, a cadre of Jews have to come together, which understands that the cause of the Jewish people is inseparable from the cause of the workers, farmers, coolies, revolution against imperialism. A cadre that is resolved to link itself with the cause for better or for worse. The Jewish people should have wanted to reunite in Spain, from which the dark spirit of reactionism had once expelled them. A people wishes to be born. Then let it embrace freedom, right from the start. For geographical reasons alone, the Jews have to wage their national war of liberation on an international scale. The Jewish people must be proud and not ask for any handouts. Its bourgeoisie corrupts it, particularly in Palestine, where it wants to be handed a whole country. But you can't just be given a whole country any more than you can be given a woman. Both must be earned. To want a whole country as a present out of charity, in other words, is it not as if you induced a woman who does not love you to sleep with you out of Christian or Jewish charity? To want a whole country, a whole country as a present from a gangster who first of all has to steal it, to then end up as a fence for English plunderer, true enough, in barbarian times, you could also get yourself a woman this way, but along with her would get her total contempt and her unquenchable hatred. One occupation that the Jews have been lacking since their heroic times has been that of soldier. But this is now becoming an imperative occupation for them, their call to arms. Once the workers and farmers and coolies have enthusiastically called out a few times, Jews to the front! to the Jewish warriors standing in for us in battle, then the Jewish will have become one people. And once we have all liberated liberty, then the time will have come when we will have to tell those Jews, look, together we have won the whole wide world. Now, if you would like to claim your portion, so you can go on and realize yourself, go ahead, take it. Oh, people chosen and sieved out by our world revolution, history has weighed on you and found you cunning. Be thanked and prosper. You say this is dangerous. This might even annoy Hitler. But that is exactly why I'm inclined to trust this matter. I am no Percy Hotspur anymore. <laughs> But in view of our current sitting in our pants politics, which paralyzes hearts with its stench and forces heads into sightless gas masks while the deluge of nationalism rises higher and higher, I am willing to trust the first and foremost seemingly most dangerous course. I kiss you fervently, your husband. <laughs> My beloved. I should follow your letter on the Jewish war with an epistle concerning the peoples, but I will do that later. First, I want to argue a little. And that, out of an innate impulse for subversion among other peoples, this is called bellicosity. And secondly, because owing to this and other atavisms, 
I do not believe in miracles. And a miracle it would be if the Jews were to go to Spain, and no miracle if they one day were to go to Germany. This because the reactionism that expelled them from there almost 500 years ago is not the same that Mr. Franco has hatched today. And what would that be in concrete terms? Alliance? Yes. Everywhere, and most definitely wherever our interests are involved. Identification? No. For we are no missionaries, and it is not up to us to bring salvation to the peoples of the world. Not in Palestine, where there are no Jewish communist workers at all, nor anywhere else. Plain, unambiguously self-serving politics. Voila. Your other point, though, seems to me somewhat more complicated, because the Golem is mistaken if he is under the impression that the Jews are a people or a self-actualizing people like other peoples. In the East, they are already a people without territory, and in the West, well, who knows what they are, including me. The former don't need to be forced, and the latter no one will ever be able to. I am the only German Jew far and wide who has learned Yiddish, in spite of Hitler. And furthermore, why should anti-Semitism, of all things, be the ferment? And for all those many years now, we are going to have to solve that issue. And also Palestine. Good God, unfortunately you are right. But if we're pitching conquest against gift, then it seems to me that a military campaign against swamp, malaria, desert, and stones, for that is what our promised land looks like, is also quite commendable. If we do want to become one people, then any old territory that the world revolution might someday want to present us with would not be of much help to us. For whichever way you look at it, that land is unavoidably bound with our past. Palestine is not at the center of our global aspirations because 2,000 years ago some people lived there from whom in some sense or another we are supposed to be descended. But because for 2,000 years the craziest of people took pleasure in preserving the past in the present. Because for them, the ruins of Jerusalem are, you could say, rooted in the heart of time. Only one thing is sure, and that is written in the Talmud or somewhere else, the Messiah will not come before all are seated at the table. So, my beloved, this is part one of my epistle, to which I wish to add that I am very happy with yours and, pardon, proud, proud that you are mine and that I received such an epistle that I love you. You already knew in Paris, as I did too. If I didn't say it, it was because I was afraid of the consequences. And the only thing I can say today is, let us try, for our love's sake. Whether I can be your wife, will be your wife, I do not know. My doubts have not been brushed away. Also, not the fact that I am married. Forgive me, my love, for this plain-spoken brutality. I will become even more plain-spoken, for although it is almost impossible to write these things down, it is still more possible than saying them out loud. I wanted to dissolve my marriage three years ago, for reasons which I will perhaps tell you someday. My only option, I felt, was passive resistance, termination of all matrimonial duties. It seemed to me that was my right, but nothing else. Separation would have been the most natural outcome for the other party, which the other party, however, never thought necessary to opt for. I held on to my passive resistance with the same tenacity that he held on to the concept of being married to me, and that to this very day. Until now, all of that was of no particular consequence. I didn't notice much of the hell that was my home, for I was working like a horse, was almost never there. And for me, everything personal was at that point only a question of nerves. That I love you is no longer anyone's business. But by the same token, it also doesn't destroy the merely outward, if you will, pretensions of the other party. I do not know if you will understand this. And it seems to me an incredible endurance test to lay these things so nakedly on the table before you. 
but I can't do anything else. Because after all, for the two of us, illusions don't really make any sense. I am searching for a word that could soften the bitterness of these lines, but I find nothing except that I love you. The idea of returning is still completely unrealistic for me, even though I feel you as close as if you were standing right behind me now. Oh, were the power of all wishes only mine. Your H. My darling, I don't like waking up without finding a letter from you. It's the first time the mailman didn't bring anything, probably the mailman's fault. He should be fired if he ever again fails in this, his most primitive task. I am writing to you in French to punish you in all tenderness, for you know, my sweetheart, I love you with all my heart and all my body. The soul doesn't come into play because it doesn't exist. <laughs> Awful weather we're having. Too bad. But I won't have to go for a walk. Much better that way, you know. I don't like to have to go walking without you. No, I'm going to find myself a glass of dry vermouth for he who has sorrows, read, longing, also has liqueur. I will try to overcome my wrath and patiently await the second post to bring me a little letter. My dearest, very many kisses, no? H. Dearest, when I compared the Rembrandt print with the original painting today, I noticed that in the print they touched up points in Rembrandt which they misunderstand and therefore cherish in him. Because it makes him harmless and easy to chit-chat about without having to think about him too closely. They gave him a nice chiaroscuro tone and a nice gold-brown tone. The original is by far harder, clearer, and more real. And it is precisely this, the tale of this body, that makes it beautiful and awakens the longing for such a well-used possession. For this is not an Aphrodite, not like the ones before her, no goddess of the Greeks, and yet a goddess, no mistress, though divine as in the Renaissance, and yet a mistress. She is decked out like a handmaiden of Venus, like a hetera. And wears jewelry over her naked body. But there's no deception. See how the face dominates. Um, this one is no other than Miss Rembrandt herself. Preparing the toilette de Venus so that right after she can be a mistress, a goddess, a divine mistress, and an artful hetera to her husband. But only to her husband, needless to say. This is Rembrandt's great contribution to the liberation of woman. He makes her man's companion, introduces her into history, and proves that she has a history of her own by painting into the portraits traces of her various stages in life. Rembrandt discovers woman, glorifies woman, and shows how at once she can be a goddess, mistress, female, and hetera. That, my love, is how the large steps towards a liberation of woman look, insofar as they are faithfully mirrored in the art of painting. Your husband, having to walk without you through the Louvre today, thought about these things a bit so that he could write you about them, but also so that both you and he could feel that you were there, at least in some way. My dearest, I realize how much I am talking about us, and especially about you. And I tumble into pleasant confusion about this, wondering what is the cause and what is the effect, as I can no longer tell what it is, what it actually is. Is it that the light I perceive in the whole wide world is centered on you? explaining and transfiguring you to me 
or rather, if all the light I see radiating from you helps illuminate the beautiful things of the world for me. But happily, I neither wish nor need to distinguish this in writing to you, because both emanates from me in a vibrant motion, intertwining with each other, circling each other, in a constant expansion, in a beautiful upward spiral. You, my very own, do you realize that I am the man with a plum that will sound your debts? The man who has the anchor to anchor himself in you, the man who has the drill that will that will make all the vibrant springs of passion flow from you. The man who has to plow, that will plow you so thoroughly that all the nourishing juices within you will awaken. Hannah, do you long for me as I long for my ocean, my harbor, my fountains, my own earth? I kiss you all over, kiss my way to you, into you. I want once more to be in the arms, between the legs, on your mouth, on the breasts, and in the lap of my wife, your Heinrich. My dear. Beloved, one and only dearest, I am very proud and very happy I was with you in the night. You see, dearest, I always knew, even as a kid, that I can only truly exist in love. And that is why I was so frightened that I might simply get lost. So I made myself independent. And about the love of others would brand me as cold-hearted, I always thought. If only you knew how dangerous love would be for me. And when I met you, suddenly I was no longer afraid after that first fright, which was just a childish fright pretending to be grown up. It still seems incredible to me that I managed to get both things, the love of my life and a oneness with myself. And yet, I only got one thing when I got the other. But finally, I also know what happiness is. My darling little foolish boy, I don't think about you at all. You are with me every minute of the day because I am full of longing and I lie and wait by my mailbox. And besides, without you, I'm simply a monster. Today, my divorce decree came through. I'm going to have a lot of running around to do, but to some extent, I'm glad. You can laugh, I'm being childish to get my old name back. I've already written to you about Mum. She sees the instability of my life and wants to set up a home for me here as a sort of cover. In her eyes, I'm acting as stubborn as a mule. Voila, c'est tout. She's just come in and tells me not to forget to send you her greetings, which I'm doing now. Dearest, I kiss you from the top of your head to the soles of your feet. Your Hannah. My uh, wonderful, my tender beauty, my happiness, my pride, garden of all my desire. Today I walked about the Luxembourg for an hour and thought and dreamed of nothing but you. All the paths in the park led to you, all the wonders of nature. As I gazed at them lovingly, group themselves pleasantly to place you in their center. Hannah, it is hard to be sober when I'm as much in love as I was a year ago, but even more. For my desire is still as fresh as my love. How all that grows and grows and yet is still bearable. 
And then a letter from you arrives making me crazy with joy. I've shown you what happiness is. I make you happy as you make me happy. After all, you are my happiness, so did I show you to yourself? You turn into who you are. I did too. I turned you, my little darling, from a girl into a woman. <laughs> how marvelous, but how did I manage to do that? Because it was only through you that I really became a man. Here's a miracle. Believe in it. My sweet woman, you are to your husband everything that a woman can be to a man. You're all that and much more. My wife, I do not know what this more could be. It can't be explained, as you are the whole sum of my love that comprises all love within it. So it is the more that makes the whole greater than the sum of the parts. That is a trace of heaven marvelous to possess. So, do you now know exactly what you are? You're mine, and I'm yours. And that, back and forth, in an eternal blissful blending, until in our child we can no longer keep each other apart. I kiss you all over and all around, and I make you completely mine. Your Heinrich. Thank you. Megan Sissler as Hannah Arendt and Richard Klaasson as Heinrich Blücher. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> oh, lovely, lovely, lovely.